I am now. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a small group, and um, I will talk louder in the future. Thank you, Dr. Yokin. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, item C1, consideration discussion on possible action regarding uh, the 2016-17 budget. Mr. Hutchison. Okay, all board members have to be less than 410 and... <laughs> 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 <laughs
we'll show you what we're talking about here in just a few minutes. Uh, presently, we have, uh, we have approved no exceptional items for the 16-17 school year. However, we believe with our current budget in 2015-16, we have some capacity to be able to address some of those needs. Uh, some of those needs do have to uh, do with vehicles, vehicles uh, in our white fleet that are either having to go to ones that need to be uh, uh, rotated off the fleet because of their condition. Uh, for example, an ag truck uh, needs to be replaced. We have some of our technology folks um, who are borrowing vehicles, uh, and we have some of our folks in uh, maintenance and operations. So vehicles is a part of that. These are one-time requests. Obviously, they're not personnel that are not ongoing. If we have capacity in our current year, we'd like to take care of that uh, here uh, as well. Also, the appraisal software, uh, starting in next year in 2016-17, we'll be moving uh, to from PDAS, our teacher uh, appraisal system, to TTES, which are be our new appraisal system. Uh, it will be a lot of administrative work on the principal and the assistant principal's part, and a lot of work on the teacher's part uh, on this new appraisal system. Uh, we can get an appraisal software that will help the flow of information for all parties concerned, and uh, we would like to purchase, we're, we're planning to purchase that this year uh, under the current budget to have that in place for the beginning of next school year. Uh, Adam consolidated. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, are we saying I, I lost your penny in the card on the appraisal software? Did you say better than what you have? Is that what you're the, the appraisal system or is or going to be a, a better system. It is going to be a uh, an arduous system uh, to manage the amount of documentation and flow of information for both the principal and the teacher who is being appraised. This software system will help facilitate the flow of information and make it easier for both our principals and our teachers through that process. It's currently hard. Right. We're getting a better system. But yeah, it sounded like he said the opposite. No, I think what he's saying is we're getting a better system that's going to be harder, but we're going to get software to manage that increased difficulty. For the, man for the management of the process, yes. It's, gonna, it's a more rigorous system. It's going to be better for instruction. We're excited about that. Okay, so more rigorous is different from harder. The management of the information will be harder as well, and more it will be required of that than has been required in our previous PDAS uh, appraisal system. I'm sorry, I'm kind of mixing things up. Obviously, yeah. I'm not being very clear. It doesn't sound good, but if we want to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to a more complicated and more detailed system. Our current and system won't are in a more comprehensive, mm -hmm. and our current system software will not manage deal with that. it. That is almost exactly right. Our current software system won't handle the new one because it's, it's married to the PDAS, the old okay. system. So we can do things um, pen and paper and those types of ways uh, uh, and do that on ways we create in-house, or we can use this management system that will help us and will help uh, everybody be able to uh, manage the documents and everything involved with that. Sure. Sorry about that. So... At any rate, the plan is to purchase that under current budget and not add anything to the budget at this point uh, for the 16-17 for exceptional items. We will show you the holds here in just a few minutes. Oh, thank you. I was getting ready to talk about a &M Consolidated High School Theater. The, uh, the theater at a &M Consolidated, the auditorium uh, over there uh, has some needs. Perhaps you've been in there. There are some lighting needs. There are some sound system needs. Uh, and there are, um, uh, there's the, the main curtain has a tear in it on the bottom right-hand corner. If you've not seen it now, you won't not see it. Uh, <laughs> it's there. Uh, there are some other things as well. It, the, it, is, it has been there a while. Uh, it needs a, a little bit of, uh, of TLC uh, as far as that goes. Uh, there are a number of different solutions available. I don't know. Uh, some, some very minuscule, some very comprehensive, but very expensive. Uh, we have allocated of this number, Mike, I think it's 121000 is the amount that we have allocated, which is more of the middle-of-the-road number uh, uh, for what is needed in a and Consolidated High Schools uh, Theater and Auditorium. So that, that's what we're looking to take care of, again, as I said, with our current budget. Okay. Uh, now, let's just talk about budget requests that we have on hold as of right now, um, or based on last Friday when the, ca the Cabinet met. Uh, we have $312,000 in new position, which I believe is five or six. We'll show you those in a second. And we have uh, $205,000 in exceptional items for next year that we have on hold. 
So what are the positions that we have said yes to? Well, we're going to have a, a third uh, intermediate school, and we're rounding close to a name. I can't wait to tell you about that next month. Um, well, we're going to have a principal, uh, and we do have a principal, Kelly DeGear, and we plan on having Ms. DeGear hire a secretary halfway through the year. Uh, and so that would be a half of the secretary's salary. Obviously, that would need to be put in next school year's budget. Uh, and there are the two high school counselors that we talked about, one for Consol and one College Station High School that was on our priority list earlier. Uh, classroom teachers, we're looking for three additional intermediate school teachers, one additional middle school teacher, which is actually two half positions, taking two half positions and making them whole, uh, and then three and a half additional high school teachers net. So there will be a... a uh, lowering of a little bit in one area, and then so it'll be 3.5 total net teachers at the high school level, classroom teachers. Um, as far as College View High School is concerned, what we're looking to do uh, to start is um, have a half time nurse uh, that will be at that uh, facility uh, and will also serve as the nurse, nurse coordinator for our LVNs across the district. So it'll be an RN position and will serve as a nurse coordinator. Uh, and so that is uh, uh, what our recommendation is. That, that's what our approved position is going forward at this time. Uh, and then we have some other campus staff. We've got, uh, uh, because of growth in the dual language program, an additional elementary dual language teacher, uh, one dyslexia teacher, uh, and a reading specialist uh, would be added as well based on, based on numbers, based on need. Okay. As far as district-wide positions um, for facilities and maintenance, uh, one plumber. Uh, and we, we currently have one plumber. John, we have three and a half HVAC technicians now? And this would be uh, going to four and a half um, HVAC techs, uh, adding an additional one there. Uh, we do have one other position that's on hold uh, for facilities and maintenance. Uh, for technology, uh, the, we have a network administrator position uh, and a data analyst. You'll recall when we did our last management oversight <laughs> workshop for technology uh, when Mr. Hutchison was in here. Mr. McIntyre talking about uh, technology and the number of uh, iPads and number of laptops and number of desktops uh, that are being serviced by uh, our folks in College Station ISD as being double or triple the industry standards. Uh, this is uh, our work to try to address some of those needs, not only just in technicians, but uh, centralized folks to help free up time for technicians to be able to do the work, uh, meeting the needs of the machine. So, um, so we're looking at a network administrator and a data analyst. Uh, we've also had some internal moves uh, inside uh, the district, and we're backfilling a uh, secretary position with a um, telecommunications position right now. So it's really a, a net wash to the budget. And so that's happening currently. So we're able to hopefully take care of those needs here very, very soon, as soon, soon as we can get that, that job posted. Uh, and purchasing. Uh, we are moving out to... Um, Mr. Silva is getting ready to have neighbors out there, and we're about to open the purchasing uh, and warehouse facility out there on Rock Prairie Road. Uh, it is much bigger. It has four levels of, um, of pallets and um, forklifts and a lot of technology that go in there. However, when you go back and you look at our staffing, we have the same staffing and purchasing and warehouse that we had in the 2000s. Uh, so we've got the same amount of uh, and somebody's car is going. Uh, we've got the same amount of staff. We we're much bigger, more campuses, more miles being driven. Uh, we've got as lean and uh, efficient as we can. It's, it's time for us to go to the third courier. And so that has uh, been said, uh, agreed to as a position by the cabinet uh, as of last Friday. And finally, for curriculum instruction, we talked about that a, a number of occasions. Um, uh, the, we would be looking to go to a science coordinator. Right now we have an English language arts coordinator and a math coordinator. Uh, this would be, we have math science that would be splitting it, so Jennifer Smith would be able to go all math and hire a science coordinator. Um, we do have some needs for uh, additional help in special services, including an instructional leadership position, uh, which, which could be a coordinator, could be something different. We're still trying to figure that out based on some other personnel moves that are happening right now, uh, and a need for an additional diagnostician. As we grow, as we add students, as we add campuses, uh, we have more needs for assessment staff, and so... We have a need for an additional diagnostician. Okay. The holds as of um, uh, last Friday are about are three hundred twelve thousand dollars to middle school teachers um, that we we would be looking to add to College Station Middle School one additional intermediate school teacher 
above the three that we have added already. Uh, a maintenance supervisor uh, for Mr. Hall's area currently that he has um, a custodial supervisor, his ground supervisor, but he's, oper he's been operating without a maintenance supervisor for a number of years. That person would work with uh, Renee Ramirez on a daily basis and supervise uh, work that's going on uh, at all 18, 19 of our facilities around the district. Uh, we continue to grow and the federal requirements uh, for, fe uh, for the use and monitoring and tracking of federal funds continues to grow as well with new EDGAR requirements. Um, as a result, we have a need for an additional accountant to be able to help uh, with those uh, additional uh, needs and requirements. Uh, and then again, going back to technology again, this would be a, a junior network administrator to help work with the uh, additional network administrator that we just approved or said yes to in a, a slide or two ago. Uh, exceptional items of $205,000 are two software systems, a student data management warehouse that we've been, uh, which has been a part of our long range technology plan, Mr. McIntyre, for eight years. Uh, and that we still have not been able to address the needs of what we want to there and find the things that we uh, want to use. Uh, the, Mr. McIntyre and some of his group are taking a, uh, a visit to another district in the Houston area to look at uh, a system there that might work well for us. Right now, we have that on hold for next year. And the inventory control system, I talked about Edgar just a few minutes ago as far as uh, all the items that are purchased with federal funds and the inventory control requirements uh, that, that come with that. This would be a, a, an additional barcode uh, scanning system that would help uh, with that process. And again, that's on hold. And then we have some money in there for Oakwood, a and Middle, and Consol band equipment that have been request, requested by um, uh, student activities. So any questions on either yeses or holds before we go forward and look at the charts and graphs? They're all at Cypress Grove. Uh, they've already had some additional help with an additional science teacher or half science teacher that was addressed last year. I believe they had a half science or and a half science half orchestra. Did I get that right? It was a half science half orchestra teacher, which you don't find this. Yeah. Social studies. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so anyway, that those are uh, some of those needs have already been addressed. Other questions? Okay, moving on to our initial budget run for 16-17. Uh, just to remind everybody where we are, we're looking for a student enrollment increase of 3.75%. Um, <clears throat> our property value increase, last month we had it 5% based on the preliminary values that we received uh, from the Bryan Central Appraisal District. We have adjusted that to 6% at this point. Um, property values we will know for sure by the last week in July. Uh, of what those what that number will be after all of the um, uh, um, con contests go through. Both of those are still relatively conservative. Uh, I would not. Uh, I would call these more. Um, I would call them liberal, but more realistic. Uh, earlier on in the process that maybe we've done in the past. Um, when you think about, we had one year of about 6.3% growth, and then we had another year of about almost 7, and then last year we jumped up this number to 4%. We actually came in a little under that in actual enrollment growth. Uh, so 3.75, we, we've, we've kind of always gone 3 or 3.5%. Three we went 4 this last time. We didn't get 4. We're backing down to about 3 and 3 quarters, and I think that's probably pretty close. Um, I would not be surprised if this property value number went up, but not up dramatically. Now, if it does, that's great for us. Um, uh, if it went seven percent, things would be looking really, really, really great. But I, uh, no one is really ready to go there at this point. We'll see how the the protests go in in July, uh, in June, and all that. Yes, sir. They are, um, I think, effectively conservative, if you like that. Um, it allows us to come closer to, I think, what reality will be next year, uh, but still on a conservative side. But it, it keeps us from leaving, I think, uh, too much uh, being too conservative. 
then we're leaving personnel and those types of, of things on the table throughout the course of the year when we could use the help in the classroom or something of that nature. So is it conservative? Yes. Is it as conservative as previously? No. Thanks, Mike. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, we have uh, projected or right now in this first budget, budget run a salary increase of 2%. I'll remind the board and the community uh, that for employees, this is a net 1.5% salary increase. 2016-17 will be the last year of the phase-in of the higher employee contributions towards TRS retirement. Starting uh, off three years ago, the employee retirement employees gave 6.4% of their uh, salary. Um, to TRS, that went from 6.4 to 6.7 two years ago to 7.2% this year to finally 7.7% next year. So, uh, so for this next year, a 2% salary increase, which would be an expenditure for us, would be a net 1.5% uh, for CSISD employees, in fact, public school employees across the state. Uh, as you are well aware of, Board, uh, you, you were, uh, did a lot of work last year in addressing uh, and looking at the district health insurance, uh, the manner in which we support our employees in regards to their health insurance needs. We changed from a flat um, contribution for every employee to a, a leveled or a tiered system based on the type of insurance that is selected and added uh, a little north of $900,000 to the annual budget last year uh, and able to do that to help offset some of the rising cost of health care. With that having been done last year, we do not anticipate this, but this budget does not reflect any increase in health insurance uh, coverage from the district perspective for this upcoming year. And right now we have a supply of materials increase of 1%. We were at 0% last year. We're at 1% this year. You can always work through that. That's of, of the budget. Um, more than 80% of the budget is, uh, is personnel. So when you talk about supplies and materials, that's a, a smaller part of it, but it can get us some, uh, a little bit of capacity if we need to work on that as we progress throughout the spring. Um, there will be a test on this. Uh, at the end. So this is uh, our old friend, the, um, uh, the, the revenue template. We were looking at the 16-17 school year right here. You will see the reflection of a 3.75% increase in average daily attendance, 6% increase in local property tax, for a $98.7 million, .98 million uh, budget uh, on the revenue side. On the appropriation side, you see the increase of 2% for payroll cost, the 1.42% of additional staff, um, and then you can see all of our other uh, factors in here as far as capital projects and, and others. And you'll see that we are projecting right now a two, just north of a $2 million deficit budget. I will go back to the current year and go all the way to the top and see that we are an ADA increase, average daily attendance increase of 4.1%. That has been updated through the fifth six weeks. Uh, Mr. Martindale, Ms. Parks, and her staff uh, are doing a good job of keeping us up to date of what our actual numbers are. So what you see reflected right here is where we were at the end of the fifth uh, six weeks. We will see where we are at the end of the sixth six weeks, and we will know. This will become the, the floor of which this percentage increase goes off of. So. If this goes from 12,195 to 12,207 or however many, that will be the floor multiplied by this and then we'll get our ADA number and that's a big driver uh, as to how much money is available on the revenue side. You will notice over here in this current year that we reimbursed ourselves $2.11 million uh, for bond work that was done prior to the um, passage of the two November 2015 <coughs> bond for design of intermediate school number three and other projects. And so that's how you see that reflected there. Um, some of the outlay for that was in this current year, but some of it was in the previous school year. So this 2.1 overshadows the 1.6 that we have there. So we won't have this 2.1 in our out years. Uh, as we stand right now, we had an adopted budget of $1.8 million deficit. As we sit the end of the fifth six weeks, we, our deficit is just a little bit over a million dollars. So uh, where we end up at the end of, uh, of August and where we are in our annual, uh, our annual audit, which we'll get in December, we'll see. But we're, we're hopeful to be even less than this number right here. What that does, it doesn't make any more money appear in the out years. What it does is it allows us to take less out of our fund balance 
allow that number to that number stay a little bit higher than we projected. Okay. So as you can see, our projected deficit budgets as we go uh, for the years uh, for the out years, I will highlight the 2018-19 school year, which would be 3.7 million dollar deficit budget. That would be the uh, planned year uh, opening of middle school number three and elementary school number three. So we already have built in three million dollars of additional uh, um, staffing for that year. So the thing that we really like to track is that very bottom line, which shows our cash flow needs, which is 17.5% of uh, the operating budget. You'll see where we are in the 2019-20 school year. We're just about $350,000 below that 17.5% caution and a little over a million out in 2021. For the visual learners, this is what that looks like. Uh, so I'll walk everybody through. Uh, the graph that we've been using for the last two years to show our, our fund balance projections. I'll start with this. Don't know what it looks like over here. It's supposed to be yellow, yellow meaning caution. Uh, kind of washed out on a big screen here, but this is the 17.5% uh, number uh, here as far as cash flow needs uh, all the way out in the 2021 school year. This red line was when we first got together in May of 2014 to try to look at ways we could uh, stop relying on our fund balance. This is the very first line that we showed. The green uh, is where we ended up last year, our audited 2014-15 numbers. So what you'll notice is that for the 13-14 year, we did not have as big of a deficit as we thought. So we have more money than expected in our fund balance remaining. When you fast forward to the end of last year, 14-15, uh, we came back with actually a $325,000 surplus when we had anticipated about a $2 million deficit budget, excuse me, about a $3 million deficit budget. Uh, and so you can see we actually added a little bit to the fund balance. So from where we were here to where we thought we were going to be, we're in a much better position. So you can look at the slope of the line, and you can see that it is uh, a, a little less steep. We still have some out year uh, uh, needs that are coming for us with the opening of a third intermediate, a third middle and a 10th elementary. So the blue is where we are today as of April uh, uh, of 2016. So here's where we were at the end of last year. We're already seeing that we're going to come in, we believe, uh, uh, higher, uh, uh, taking less out of our fund balance than we had projected. So that, again, that number is creeping up a little bit higher um, uh, towards the $30 million range uh, in our fund balance. You can see where we're going. So we do cross over the caution line in 2019-20, which we saw in that last uh, table at about 350000 and then a little bit over a million in 2021. So we are talking about, we are living here, we're making decisions for this school year, and we know we have to have an eye towards 2019-20 uh, and 2021. So uh, all that being said, uh, would love to answer any questions that you have or hear uh, any comments about the things that, uh, that have been approved or on hold or um, what our uh, long-term projections look like or whatever you'd like to talk. Thank you for the summary. Um, I guess the, the one thing that comes to mind for me first is that when we look at positions, educational positions that are on hold, Obviously, we really need to look at that closely to ensure that we're um, focusing on what we can do to be sure that all, all the students are getting what they need. And, and as we've spent quite a bit of time together last night, we realize that um, not all students are equal, right? And so in some situations, we, we perhaps may need to have more support, and we want to be sure that we're doing that when we can. So any other comments? I'd like to address that. Okay. So there are a couple opportunities that we have um, as, as we go through this spring for additional funding. The first comes right here with our average daily attendance. If this number is a little higher at the end of the six, six weeks, that makes this number a little higher, which makes adding in 3.75% makes this number a little higher and helps with our revenue. We have an opportunity, I think, at that time to address positions on hold that have to do with the classroom at that time and still be able to get somebody into the classroom. The other area that could get increased is our property tax number. Unfortunately, we won't get that number for sure, the official number, until the end of July. 
at the end of July, it would be, it would be very difficult to move forward with a campus level position, almost impossible because uh, for somebody coming from another district, they're past the, uh, the, the resignation date. Uh, so we are actually looking at campus level positions, perhaps what we could do based on our ADA numbers at the end of the, uh, the six, six weeks and perhaps some of these other non-campus based positions if we have some capacity uh, provided to us by the appraisal district later on in the summer. Uh, which means, because we can hire an accountant at almost any time or a supervisor, those types of things. They don't have to be in place by the first day of school. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes. Uh, would you explain to us a little bit about what it means if we go below that yellow line? Absolutely. It's a red lines are bad. It's a Harris line. So we start paying uh, employees, most employees, uh, in September uh, of a school year. Our, our fiscal year goes from 9-1 to 8-31. We get uh, periodic uh, uh, deposits from the state. But since we are a high property value district, most of the money we get comes from local taxes. Local taxes do not start coming in most people pay theirs by the end of the year, December 31st. Some will split their payments and make them by November 30th and January 31st. So we start getting some, um, uh, some money in in the late fall, but most of that does not come in till the winter time um, uh, as, as, the, as the calendar year ends. So there is a cash flow issue that could arise. We believe that about 17 and a, having a cushion of about 17.5% of our total operating budget in the bank in our fund balance allows us to be able to pay out during September, October, November, and December the payroll and other needs that we have at that time without having to, uh, to, to borrow any money to be able to make payroll. Now, there are plenty of districts in the state who do this. Uh, they're called TANs. They're called tax anticipation notes. They're low interest loans that basically get you uh, a little bit of money to make the payroll until your, uh, uh, until your tax revenue rolls in. So if we were to dip below that line and if um, we were uh, uh, low enough that we would need a little bit of help, it would just mean that the board would authorize the district to go and get uh, a small note to be able to make payroll and get paid back basically the next month or next month or two. Okay. Uh, and then on the chart prior to that, that one, it looks like you have one and a half percent. What did we decide a percentage point approximates on payroll increases? I'm looking at those out years and I'm trying to figure out what flexibility we have if for whatever reason we decide it doesn't make sense to borrow money in the future to pay payroll. You mean uh, what would we, uh, if we went down to a percent or a half percent? Yeah, that's that? what I'm trying to figure out what kind of flexibility we have built in it. 750 for a percentage? I believe that's what it was last year. Please allow us to look at that and verify that number. But memory serves. No, that's, I mean, that's good enough. That, that kind of tells me kind of how much wiggle room we would have in the future to play with that one well, cost maybe, number since it's the, the biggest. So yeah, I see we've got. 16 numbers, you know, and when you look at 2021 numbers, that'll probably that'll be different. Closer right? to a million probably would be oh, my right. guess, but I get that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Harris, also the projections out also um, on your increase in property values, we're using 4%, um, which are uh, currently more conservative than what I would anticipate. So as you uh, closer to reality of those particular years, I would expect those property value rates that we're using to be much stronger that we'll have a significant impact on cash flow numbers. Well, especially if we give the demographics that were given to us, those seem very conservative to me. Uh, I would agree. However, we're sitting here in 1516. It is hard to go I know. too much higher down there and, and get ourselves in a bind. So I think one of the reasons you see things like this getting better is because as we start getting farther and farther out, we're getting more and more kids, which is incre increasing our tax revenue. And, and helping us, us out uh, in the long run. Okay. And 
I, I'll just tell you, I, I appreciate, I mean, I understand and <coughs> find value in what you said. Uh, I, I do think those are fairly conservative estimates that give us enough flexibility to adjust in future years to keep from dipping below that line uh, if we need to. Uh, but also the pending litigation and the outcome of that um, creates enough uncertainty that, quite frankly, I, I think you said it well, uh, we're leaving too much on the table that could be benefiting students in the classroom uh, and supporting our teachers, the people behind the scenes that make their work possible. So I, I'm... Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. We'll move on to C2, consideration, discussion, and possible action related to the TASB Update 104. Um, Dr. Yoke, members of the board, uh, Texas Association of School Boards are our policy analysts. They do our board policy and manage it for us, uh, including the policy portal online. Uh, as a result of changes in um, uh, in the laws and especially every two years as the legislature comes into town uh, there are needs for updates to uh, legal and some local policies I will just uh, uh, remind the board that the administration your administration and a number of our department heads went through a, a policy audit with TASB and our policy consultant earlier this month spent a Monday April the 4th and Monday April the 11th going through our and making sure our understanding uh, of local policy uh, is accurate and we are following local policy, uh, board policy um, accurately with our policies and procedures that uh, guidelines that we use. Uh, we do anticipate an update, a local policy update coming before you uh, later on this summer uh, based on the work that was done there. What you have here uh, and you've been given in transmittal is uh, a regular policy update, update 104. Uh, many of the policies are of the legal variety, meaning they are not really up to us to decide. Uh, because they are law, uh, but there are some uh, ramifications for us uh, on local policy as well. Uh, what we typically do is give this to you in transmittal, use this board workshop as an opportunity to answer any questions or uh, jot down a note so we can get some information to you in the future. Uh, it will be our anticipation uh, for uh, the board to consider this at the May regularly called meeting. So with that, does anybody have any questions related to policy update 104? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only person that understood it was Mr. Harris, so. Okay, no. We'll move on to C3 consideration discussion of possible action related to the 2015 16 community based accountability system. Dr. Ealing. Thank you, Dr. Yoke, and members of the board. I like talking budget. I don't necessarily like talking policies, but I love talking about community-based accountability. It really is a, a great thing uh, that those that have come before us uh, have, uh, have seen a vision for in College Station ISD. Uh, I do applaud the board and your vision and those uh, members of the board before us that decided to be involved of the Texas High Performance Schools Consortium. And we've been a proud member of that institution since it was enacted by the legislature uh, back in 2012. Part of our work with the consortium uh, is really trying to push on a number of areas uh, for um, ensuring that our systems and our schools are ready for the needs of the future. We and that includes looking at our, our learning standards, includes looking at how we assess our students, uh, the digital tools uh, that are available uh, to kids these days and making sure we're making the, uh, uh, the best use of them to get them ready to be uh, successful in the work world. Uh, and one key component of that is looking at um, how we decide to evaluate ourselves or hold ourselves accountable and going through a process to determine what is important to, to the schools in College Station, to the community and the board in College Station ISD. Right now we are on our third iteration of our community-based accountability system for the 2015-16 school year. Uh, Molly Perry, who is our Executive Director for Special Services and Accountability, it does a lion's share of the work in this area and works with folks uh, in central office and uh, on, our, uh, on, on our campuses uh, to, to take what we have and make it better each year. I'm excited about the work that's been done. I'm excited to see uh, how this uh, instrument is evolving, becoming more user friendly, and quite frankly, how it's able to tell our story about many of the great things that are going on 
in College Station ISD that don't involve a test that's given in April or May of the school year. Uh, and so the, the, to the extent that we can highlight that, that information and share that with our public and, and really make the work that we do about those key areas and not about uh, a STAR test or an end of course test, uh, that, that I think there's a really positive, uh, really, really positive for College Station ISD. Uh, Molly's here today to talk about where we are uh, in our process, uh, including some changes that we have uh, looking forward to for the school year. And with that, I'll let you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, so this evening, I would just first of all like to echo what Dr. Ely said in terms of being excited about this work. This is really an opportunity to highlight strengths of our district, but also to take a close look at what's important to us and, and focus on areas that we do need to continue improving and um, in increase our work. Um. <laughs> so um, let's start here. Um, as Dr. Ely summarized, you know, the system is really about what we define as success as a district, and um, and it does give us an opportunity to really be creative and and share with our community um, results that are tied back to the things that we know that are important. Um, this is very much a process. It is the third year, and so we've really taken this as an opportunity every year to improve. And, and the improvement process actually starts um, before we even score the, the current system, because as we go through that process with campus principals, um, they always provide really great feedback about, you know, have you thought about this, or could we consider this for next time? And so we actually keep a running list as we're scoring the current system of what might be um, good adjustments for the next year. Um, another great opportunity that we had this year was to collaborate with other districts, um, both those that were in the infancy of developing their own community-based system, uh, as well as those that have come alongside us with the High Performance Schools Consortium. And so um, through that collaboration, we brought, brought back some really um, different ideas about what we might do to improve the system this year, and so I'll be sharing some of that um, with you all tonight. Um, but as you can see, it really is a cycle, and, and where we are tonight is uh, we've already approved those standards through DEIC uh, last week, and so we'll be completing those evaluations here over the next few months as we um, continue to gather uh, data and as data is coming in from the current school year. Um, so that will all be reported online, and then I'll be back with you all um, probably in August to share the results. Um, so if you'll recall, we really framed this whole system on our existing commitments. Those were predetermined notions that we feel uh, as a district are very important um, to us based on community feedback and and that really revolves around you know our staff and our curriculum and our opportunities through programs um, I apologize it's really hard to see the color there but um, but family involvement is also critical uh, as well as um, using those taxpayer resources really wisely we know because of House Bill 5 that we're required to report certain uh, areas both at the district and campus level and those are uh, those listed here that, that shouldn't be uh, new to any of you all, but we've really um, made the system even more comprehensive than what is required um, by framing that and aligning it with those core commitments. And so those are the, the additional areas. Um, one of the things that we noticed over the last few years is that um, a number of those areas really are district-wide indicators, and, um, and it didn't really make sense to have every campus rate themselves on um, things like highly qualified staff when 100% of our staff are highly qualified or the use of the first or fast system under financial. And so we've really um, taken a step back um, by looking at some other districts that are um, considering it in this way and said, you know, what are the things that we really want to measure at the campus level and then what are those areas that we really want to focus on telling the story as a, a comprehensive school district. And so that is really one of the big changes as we go through. Um, that you'll see is um, a greater emphasis on CSISD as a district rather than individual campuses in some areas. So with that commitment one, um, again, this is about our staff. This is about do we have qualified um, teachers? Do we have a low turnover rate of those teachers looking um, at ourselves compared to um, state rates? Um, and then do we have a great pool of applicants? You know, for every position that we have, do we have a number of folks to choose from that are, are really great op options for us as a district. And, and really the only change that we um, made in this particular area is reporting at the district only level, which it really kind of already was. Um, commitment two is looking at a curriculum alignment. And this again is a very district focused initiative. Do we have um, you know, 
that developed across the core content areas? Um, do we have good opportunities for choice across levels and campuses? Um, how are our students doing in ELA and math? Uh, and then finally, um, what is our college readiness component looking like? So we do have some other recommended changes uh, for uh, commitment number two, though. Um, one of the components in there is our workshop model implementation in ELA and mathematics. And um, we really looked closely at how we were measuring that and decided that we would shift that to frequency per week rather than percentage of staff that were involved because we expect everyone to be involved and so now it's a matter of increasing that frequency. Um, we also felt like this would be a good opportunity to really um, look at what other measures do we have outside of STAR state assessment um, that can give us good information about students' performance in English uh, language arts and math. And one of the most exciting components that we are adding this year is a growth measure for reading. Previously, we measured um, where students were at the end of first grade, but we know that students develop at very different rates when it comes to reading acquisition. And really what's important is where they are by the end of third grade in terms of reading level. What's important more so in first grade is the growth. So those students that are coming in perhaps below where we would expect, are they growing adequately? Conversely, are students that are coming in as fluent readers at the beginning of first grade advancing adequately and, and pushing beyond their grade level? And so this is going to give us a really good opportunity to, to gather that information. Um, then MSTAR, absolutely. Sorry, if you want me to wait to the end, I can do that too. But, uh, okay, so the change there at first grade, mm -hmm. help me understand that. If So let's say they came into first grade and they were already at or above grade level. Mm -hmm. What we're primarily concerned with is not that measure at first grade, but how much in first grade did they continue to grow? Absolutely. Okay. So if I'm if I come into first grade and I'm already reading at the beginning of second grade level, I want to get to the beginning of third. It's it's not enough just to get to the end of that current grade level for students. It's really about the growth. Um, actually, if you go to the next, I think it was one. Yeah, here we go. So um, just to give you a better idea of what that means, we measure our reading levels using a system called Fontes and Pinnell. It's a research-based system. And so this is really just looking at first grade students. If I'm coming in as a non-reader, I would consider adequate growth to be by the end of the grade year getting to level F. Now, is that at the end of first grade? No, it's not. But it's more than a year's growth for that particular student. Um, on the other hand, if I'm at an L, which is significantly above first grade reading level, well, I'm going to want to get all the way to a P. And so we worked closely, um, our um, ELA coordinator and myself, to develop a system that was vetted by our literacy specialists. And so um, this is probably my most exciting piece this year as a, a growth measure. I like it, too. Thank you. <laughs> It was something that our principals had actually been asking for for a few years, and, and we really um, finally were able to, to come to consensus on what that might be. Um, MSTAR is not the STAR, not to be confused with STAR, is a more of a curriculum-based measure that we administer in our in intermediate and middle school levels, and um, that gives us good data in terms of math performance, and so we are going to focus a little more on that. Uh, and then we did some clarifying language. Um, so this is what that workshop model change looks like in terms of you know, average number of days per week. Um, so we've got K4 reading ELA, K4 math, then 5-8 reading ELA, and 5-8 math. The reason that the standards are um, lesser, I would say, uh, and in the, the levels of 5-8 is that we began implementation at a later time. And so they're not quite where our elementaries are. Then um, we talked um, a little bit already about that adequate growth, and so that's what that particular component looks like uh, within the CBIS system. Um, then college ready. We decided that that was a little confusing. Uh, people don't really necessarily know what college ready means. You kind of have to look at the chart to figure out uh, what exactly those, those terms um, refer to, and so we decided to be a little more explicit here and just say, what percent of our students are scoring at least a 24 on the ACT or 1,100 or above on SAT? And so um, I think that that language will just help folks to know, oh, that's what they're talking about when they say college ready on uh, those assessments. Then looking at commitment three, this is really the heart of the system in terms of what's required under House Bill 5. It really is about all those different programs from fine arts to um, digital learning to GT. And so we have uh, a number of changes here. These will all continue to be campus and district measures. 
Um, we decided that we really wanted to look at that um, fine arts category and make some adjustments to align it a little more because uh, with uh, athletics there was sort of a disconnect of why do we have a higher expectation here than here when we would expect to see a large number of students participating in both of those areas. And um, then looking at second language acquisition, we were measuring that all the way through 12th grade, but really um, the sample size is so small at the high school level of students that are actually taking that TELPASS exam because they're new uh, English language learners that it really wasn't giving us uh, very good data. Um, on GT, um, we thought it would be nice to add an AP exam indicator. That was not something that we had previously um, included. Uh, then on 21st century, um, we had the term terminology character education um, previously, and really social emotional learning programs is the language that we are um, using now. And then finally, on dropout prevention, we're doing a lot of work there as we um, bring College View High School on online to look at uh, dropout prevention across all three high schools. And so we really thought, let's hold ourselves accountable for that and look at how we're going to implement. So what this looks like uh, in the system for GT, we've got a percent of students scoring a three or higher. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And um, we compared ourselves um, to the state average to really kind of get an idea. And I think we were something like 20 percentage points higher than the state average. So we thought, wow, that's pretty significant. So that's sort of going to be our baseline. Um, then this is that alignment for fine arts, just an adjustment in those criteria. Uh, and we did increase from one sweepstakes to two. So the uh, UIL team performances. Dropout prevention, this is a brand new measure uh, about those coordinated efforts for grade and credit and dropout recovery uh, programs. And eventually we would love to say that we're at exemplary, having all campuses uh, implementing a fully coordinated uh, program. Um, we're doing a lot of work in that area. Then camp, uh, commitment, Sorry. yes, absolutely. And does that coordinate with the college Partially, yes. So we've had a, uh, a dropout recovery task force that's been working since November, uh, made up of uh, credit recovery teachers, two high, two high school administrators, uh, a few of us uh, folks who, uh, who work over here, and looking at a coordinated approach uh, to how we address uh, kids falling behind in their subject by six weeks, uh, credit recovery, or the entire uh, dropout recovery student thinking of a fifth year, six year senior uh, who's coming back. Uh, and so we have, uh, we had our final meeting just earlier this week and are happy to report we've come up with a system that we believe is going to be really, uh, that will be exemplary uh, by this measure, but it's going to uh, meet the needs uh, of our kids uh, all the way throughout our system at the high school level. Try to catch as many as we can uh, before they fail even a half credit uh, by putting uh, a recovery of credit or grade recovery process in place. Uh, in the four core areas for our on-level courses uh, in, uh, in two courses in each grade level. So English 1, uh, two courses in each uh, subject area. English 1, English 2, Algebra 1, Geometry, uh, IPC in Biology, and World History and World Geography. Uh, second part will be the credit recovery, not dissimilar to the credit recovery that we have on our two comprehensive high schools, which will be mirrored at uh, College View High School. Uh, and then uh, we also looked at night school and the role that night school will play uh, and continue to play uh, for our kids needing uh, credit recovery and dropout recovery. And then finally, we looked at uh, what dropout recovery would, could look like uh, at uh, Consol and College Station High School and how it might look a little different at uh, College View. So it's been the culmination of a lot of work. We've taken two visits to different, uh, d different choice high schools and looked at how they uh, work with dropout and credit recovery programs, and uh, we're pretty excited uh, about the work that we're uh, going to be doing. Mr. McIntyre will be meeting with the um, department heads uh, at both comprehensive high schools uh, probably the first week, maybe second week of June. Start a lot of this uh, grade recovery work, uh, and then we're going to continue uh, to implement this as we as we look for full implementation by the 17-18 school year. We still will have transition. Uh, uh, as, we, as we work through this next year with College View and Timber. Is there any coordination with, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, for extracurriculars where they have to monitor eligibility, that's kind of grade and credit recovery on the front end to make sure their kids are keeping up with the work and maintaining eligibility. 
Is it that, that's not mandated through this process. However, that is done. Uh, I, I know it's done in athletics. I assume it's done in fine arts and other extracurricular activities that require no pass, no play. I know they do uh, a pretty comprehensive job of making sure uh, things are getting turned in. But that, that is usually yeah. left up to the individual program. Okay. So that's this is when those efforts were so not say, successful. So let's say there was a kid in ninth grade who failed a second six weeks in English 1, English 1 on level, say he or she got a 60. Um, this would be an opportunity for them to go back, the, the first part, the grade recovery, go back and master the concepts or the standards in the areas that they did not master that caused them to fail. Maybe it's two or three or four things. It's a very, very prescriptive approach. The student goes back and masters those. Uh, to the satisfaction of the teacher, the teacher then would go back and adjust the student's grade to a 70, not a 90 or anything like that, but they were able to recover that. Uh, and so in our old model prior to a couple of years ago, we would have to wait to a stu until a student failed for the semester and did not get that half credit for that student go into credit recovery. We think this is, uh, this is a, a great way for us to really catch kids early on and get fewer and fewer kids in credit recovery and hopefully then fewer kids in dropout recovery. This sounds like, I mean to me it sounds like a great deal. I would just, I, I think this is a great first crack from a measurement standpoint because you're implementing a brand new program. But once that program's implemented, there's nowhere else to go on a measure like this. So we just might consider in the future ha having a better measure of how well that program is working as opposed to just the fact that we have a program. I would agree so. with you. Yes. Um, you know, I think having, having this measure does help hold us accountable for that, the work in that particular area, but it, it is not as quantitative as I would imagine it will be in a few years. And I think that it doesn't necessarily capture all of the preventative approaches that are in place, um, which are. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, if, 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 I mean, the question is how how many of these? I mean, is this our accountability systems designed to measure things generally over time? And if we throw in measures that we expect to meet through the implementation of a program in one year, then how long do we keep this measure in there, or does it automatically drop out, or do we change to something else? I mean, I, I just don't know how we're, are we using these measures as one-year goals for campuses, or are we trying to come up with measures that are designed to do things long-term? They are more dynamic than they are static. Because okay. When we re-evaluate every year, that's exactly what we're doing. If we're not going to go and check ourselves off because we are doing something that right. we've always done. This is something that we haven't done. Uh, I think Molly said it well. We're going to hold ourselves accountable and make sure that we do it. Right. And once we have this set up, I anticipate this becoming a, a lot more... Uh, uh, quantitative and looking at the percentage of kids who are progressing through drop recovery and, and graduating or earning credits in a particular semester or something like that or number of right. kids even seeing a decreased number of kids involved in credit recovery because they're not even getting there so those those are the types of things that we will, that we would hold ourselves accountable to so it's almost like a anticipate in the future I mean I just I, I always kind of thought of this as much more of a fixed thing but it's almost like a performance management report where every year I'm setting some pretty some special goals that w we hope to achieve and then once those goals are met we'll move on to different different things. I would say that's a fair assumption. That's okay. Fair assumption. Good. Excellent. Thank you. And I would just add as a, a final thought you know, this this measure is not in response to a concern in terms of overall dropout numbers. Our numbers are actually quite low compared to state rates but but we do see a need um, in, in our student population for some students, and we want to make sure that we meet that. Um, so community and parent involvement. Um, this is that component where we really look at volunteering and outreach and connecting with both our parents and our community and uh, through a variety of communication means. And um, the only change that we're recommending at this time is that we move that to district level reporting as well. Um, again, it was very much already a district level measure looking at education foundation involvement, things of that nature. Um, and then commitment number five, um, with our taxpayer resources, we have lots of ways in place already to, to measure how we're doing there. 
and um, we feel like those five components are still uh, really good ways uh, to, to comprehensively look at the management of our finances and the use of our um, taxpayer resources. Um, just a few changes. Um, one would be, again, district level reporting. It already was, uh, ultimately. Um, and also one slight adjustment to the first <coughs> rating system. Um, they did change the way they report within the first system. So um, rather than having descriptive statements, we have a number of points. Uh, and so we decided that in order to be exemplary, we've got to get the maximum number of points. And um, then we set up a range beyond that in terms of recognition. With that, if you have other questions uh, or comments, I'll let you know. Thank you for that. I think we're all excited to continue to see that it, it does improve. I think that first year when we tried to identify what the variables we wanted to look at for accountability was a painful experience, just trying to walk, to talk, talk through it. And so it's nice to be it's at a, a point. Uh, Pardon? It's like it's like yeah, yeah. Like, and, and how many children have you had? <laughs> yeah. The. Right, no. So I think it's good. Does anybody have any questions? I have one question. Can we go back to the college ready slide? Yes. It, it went a little quick for me for, for one thing. Okay, so. You're, you, you have a, mar a mark there, but do we know how many of our students actually take the ACT or SAT? Do we have those kind of indicators, too, versus, like, our workforce ready? I mean, you've got some kids that um, don't choose, but we're just measuring, obviously, the kids that take it. And do, but do we know how many of percentage of our kids take the test? Is that something hesitate to try to remember that number offhand, but I could absolutely pull that pretty quickly. Um, the number of students taking SAT and ACT are, are quite high. However, that previous measure of college ready, that really only used SAT and ACT performance. Within this indicator, we still have a number of other areas um, in terms of career and technical education participation, licensures um, that our students are receiving. And, and so we are looking not only at SAT, ACT, but other um, avenues within the college ready indicator overall. We just didn't review those. Well, and I think it's interesting, too, because, um, you know, the numbers, the, the 24 and the 1100 is not, I mean, that's a, a doable number. However, that's it's on on the high side, I would think, that we're measuring our, I mean, I think that's a, that's great. It's just 24 and 1100 are high for some for some kids, and they can get in at a lower score, actually. Those numbers we actually chose because they're what um, align with that terminology of college ready. And when you look at that Texas performance report, and they tell us what percentage of our students are college ready, um, that's how they actually define that. And so we thought that it might be a good way to just sort of translate um, to a more understandable. But I absolutely, I hear what you're saying. And a number of students don't take either of those exams. They might. Right. I, I mean, that, that's the point I'm making is that, you know what, that's, I think it's great. I just, I, I think there's more to the story there because there's some kids that are going to, and I appreciate that we're looking at these high levels, but also the fact that you have kids that do go to junior college and you do have kids that do score less than those scores that you have indicating that it's a very high level of, and we should. And I might, uh, grading ourselves. I might even encourage you to leave the average score. I mean, I think our community wants to know what that average score is. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't. I don't want to tell you what to do. But I mean, to me, I completely understand getting rid of percentage of college ready graduates because people don't know necessarily what that is. But to me, an average score is an important score and one to track over time that I think our community likes to see. So, just a thought. I agree with that. That's yeah, exactly what I was thinking. I look at oh, we're going to lose our range. I, I, I think like that's that. it's a better way of saying it. But, you know, I'm just like, okay, I, I would hate to see us report to the community and, and these are 
We're on the high, uh, they're not way high or anything. But is there is there another metric in there that says percentage of kids that go to? I remember if I remember that that's in there, right? A percentage of kids that go to four year junior college schools or whatever that is. So this, as Molly said, this metric comes from the Texas uh, Academic Performance Report. It's the percentage scoring above criterion on SAT, ACT, and I don't know how they decided 24 or 1100, right. uh, but they did. So it's easy for us to get and easily reportable. Um, the numbers that you're talking about come from the Higher Education Coordinating Board. They're a, a few years in arrears, and they take students who graduated from Texas high schools and who uh, uh, who go their freshman year only uh, to a Texas public or private, if they participate, uh, a school or junior college. So we have, there's a lot of data that's missing in that. You'll recall that when we go okay. to take this year, there's, there's a lot of our kids go out of state or go military to do something else or maybe don't start that for the first semester. Uh, so it's, a no, it's a number that's outside of our control. It, it is. It's hard for, it's hard for okay. us to get a really be. Uh, no, that makes sense. I, I think it's great. I just think it's arguable that they're college ready at, some of them can go at 22, 23, and they're college ready. Oklahoma City, they're college ready. Right, 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 right. Well, and exactly, exactly. But I, I just, I, I'm glad that this is a state. It's just that I think that there are college ready kids that um, score less than and graduate in we would agree, and we have, a, as, as Molly said, we have some other metrics in there that we look at licensure and, and, and passing rates on that and some other areas as well. But what I think I'm hearing the group say is uh, you, you also would like to see uh, a mean ACT and mean SAT score on here. Right? I think it should be an an, an N, not an OR, because I, you know, I, I hear what's being said, but 45% of the students scoring that is makes us exemplary. It does not say if you didn't score that, you don't get to go to college. I mean, that, so I think we need to be um, mindful of that, that, that it's not saying uh, this is the hurdle which in which you need to pass or we don't think you're ready to go to college. We're just saying that the standards for our school district is that 45% of the students are going to, you know, score higher than that. I, I think that I'm going to use your word, granularity. Cool. Thank you so much. There it is. Granularity. <laughs> I, I, I know. The granularity provided by those ranges is something I think our community looks at. The where do the score? Where, where do we have the bulk of our students falling on a spectrum of different ranges? Well, the only other thing that changes, though, as well, is 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 so now we're we're changing because the SAT has changed. You know what counts as a score. So we just we have to be careful on whether or not we're going to use this as the training tool, or we're going to use this as a accountability of we are as a district, because it is a case where perhaps for those that are in the position of life where they're determining whether or not they think they're ready to go to college and what, th th then there's a lot more detail or granularity that they need. Because if you were to just look at that and not know anything, you're going to say, well, why did I used to make a 1600 and I was exemplary and now I make an 1100? Well, I think this is great. I mean, you know, so, I mean, so we have to be cognizant that the bar has moved. It's not you know, they've, they've changed the direction of the bar, not how high it is. I just think a lot of people will, it's funny because we all look at this whole community-based community based accountability, but this is really a place where I think the community does look, and, and I want to just make certain that it's defined, I guess, because, you know. I would agree. One of the things we could do is look at PSAT results. Um, because everybody in the 11th grade year takes a PSAT. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, people aren't familiar with the scoring system on the PSAT like they are with the SAT and the ACT. So as you put it on the website for people to look at and, and, and judge how well we're doing, it, these really do lend themselves best. Do those numbers make us look really good? Are they like 5,000 kind of numbers, or are they come in lower? Your digits. Oh, that's not good. That makes us look not good. We usually use the PSAT a little bit in our literacy component. Because we do know that all of our kids take 
atom. That's a good way to measure the rotation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can also use the algorithm that they print out and give to the students and saying if you made this on your PSAT, we would pr predict that you would make this on your SAT. And, you know, there's lots of ways to get around that, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, again, I don't think we, we want to be sure that we're not, we're not bruising anybody by what it says, but we want to be sure that the expectation is high. So, I mean, there's a, a balance there. It, it's, it, it's just a fine line, and y'all are doing a great job, and I don't, it's just one of those places where that's where, you know, I hear a lot in the community, um, but just to be sure we're, you know, I know that we're trying to make this in snapshot, but some, maybe there's some places, particularly here, where there's some, Definition at the you know like an asterisk at the bottom or I, I I don't know I don't know what the answer is it's something to that I need to think about but you know my when you went by it the first time I went, you know I had that moment of what is that really saying to um, the general public people who are not in education so and that's who we hope reads it <laughs> absolutely well we really appreciate your feedback because we do hope that the public reads it as, as we collaborated with the other districts that was it was truly everyone's top concern is that we really are putting a lot of effort into a system that we want to be very authentic and and communicate to our community about what's really in, important to them and so uh, we do want to continue to certainly track the number of people that <laughs> I mean, we, we've shared this information with a number of folks across the state, and in fact, when you go to the TASA website and you click community-based accountability, we're one of two districts that are linked in, and so we may have a number of views that aren't from us. That's exciting, too. We've done a, we've done a few. Yeah. Yeah, any other real questions or comments? The system's going to become increasingly important as our state accountability system evolves to include community based. Well, thank you. And, and it's a lot of work, and I think you should be proud that our system is considered to be one as a prime example for the rest of the state. Congratulations for that.